as the pandemic wears on, you want to make sure you don't wear out. We look around us and see a lot of people misbehaving. It's because of a lack of strength, a lack of endurance. It's when people are, feel weak and feel threatened that they misbehave. They create a lot of suffering for themselves and for other people. We look at that, we want to take it as a lesson. We want to make sure that we don't fall into that pattern. So we've got to look for strength inside. We look first outside. We find good examples. There's the example of the Buddha, the example of his noble disciples, all the way down to the Ajans. And we have to remember that they were human beings. The Buddha wasn't born Buddha. The Arahants were not born Arahants. They became that way. Now they obviously had some merit from previous lifetimes, the good deeds they'd done. But there was still work they had to do. And if they had simply leaned on their past past good actions, their past good merit, they wouldn't have gotten very far. So that's the first lesson. You're not stuck where you are. If you want to make progress, though, you have to take what you've got and learn how to develop it further, all the good things you've got. And we looked at their example exactly how they did that. There are five strengths. The strength of conviction, strength of persistence, strength of mindfulness, strength of concentration, strength of discernment. These are the things that carried them through, whatever the difficulties they had to face, and there were many. These were the strengths that they were able to fall back on and able to develop all the way to the point of the deathless. There is that passage where the Buddha asked Sariputta, do you believe that the five strengths lead to the deathless? The five faculties, which are pretty much the same thing. And Venerable Sariputta said, no, I don't believe I know. It's something we can find for ourselves. And they begin with strength and conviction. Strength of discernment is the one that makes them all solid. But we have to remember that discernment doesn't simply come from things you've read. It doesn't come from perceptions or sanya. It comes from a conviction, sata. Conviction that there's got to be a way out. There's got to be a way to survive hardships and come out not only surviving, but thriving. And what do we base that conviction on? Conviction in the Buddha's awakening. Now, that's not simply a belief that the awakening happened. We try to think about what did the Buddha awaken to? How did he awaken? What lessons can we learn? And how can we apply them to our lives? Because conviction isn't simply who you believe in or what you believe in. It's what you do based on what you believe. If it stops with believing somebody or believing something but you don't act on it, it's not really conviction. It's simply an opinion you hold to. But conviction means that you take those opinions as working hypotheses and you actually work on them. You base your actions on them. So how did the Buddha awaken and what did he awaken to? He awakened through his own actions. And this is a principle that underlies everything else he taught, that action is real, and that we do have choices, and we're responsible for our choices. If you don't believe in that, then you're going to be careless in what you do. You say, well, I couldn't help myself. The stars made me do it. 
or some outside deity made me do it, or simply physical laws working themselves out. You get irresponsible. If you believe in your actions, the first thing is you've got to be responsible. But we believe in more than that. Think of the Buddha's first knowledge. Consciousness doesn't have to depend on the body. As he saw, his consciousness went, continued as a process that went for aeons and aeons and aeons. He once commented that if you have a limited understanding of how long this has been going on, and for him limited meant forty aeons, and you know how long an aeon is, it's usually long. Even that much he said was limited. But the process of consciousness, as long as this craving can keep on going, consciousness and craving keep feeding each other. This is an insight into time. That time has gone on for a long time. It can go on for a long time, too. So think about that. Like that character in Through the Looking Glass who would like to think about two or three impossible things every day before breakfast. Well, it's good to think about the huge length of time that we've been around every day. It helps put things into perspective. As the Buddha said, the amount of tears you've shed is greater than the water in the oceans. The amount of blood you've shed, having had your head cut off for having been a thief, for having been a highway robber, for having been an adulterer, in each case, it's more than the water in the oceans. So it's good to think about that vast stretch of time to give rise to a sense of sonwega as motivation to want to get out. Because as the Buddha saw, you can go to many different kinds of rebirth, up and down. And there's no place where you can stay and say, okay, that's it. You rise and then you fall. You fall and then you rise. And John Mahabhava once made a comment that people who like to plan their next life really don't believe in rebirth. They say, oh, okay, I'll make merit here. And I saw this in Thailand. There's that story of the, the nun who was sponsoring a, a hut there at Watasokaram. They stopped by the construction site one day, and she was directing the workers. The hut was coming out really nicely. And I asked her if she was building her palace for the next lifetime. She said, no, this is my vacation home. My palace is already built someplace else. You get it all planned out like that. You will think you've, you, once you've gotten there, then everything is going to be solid and secure. But no, it's going to fall away too. So think about this. It gives rise to a sense of real sangwega, which basically means terror at how long this has been going on, how much longer it could go on if we don't get our act together. Now, the first knowledge was knowledge in time. The second knowledge is more knowledge in space, seeing the whole universe, all beings in the universe, dying and then being reborn in line with their karma. This is when the Buddha was able to begin to see a pattern. He had trusted in the principle of karma up to that point. After all, he did, if he hadn't believed in the power of action, he wouldn't have tried to find a path of practice. But this is where he saw it. The, the karma comes from your intentions. Your intentions come from your views. So you've got to be very careful about your views, how you talk to yourself. This is one of the huge ways in which we make ourselves suffer. I mean, cravings are basically ourselves talking to ourselves. As the Buddha said, we go around with craving as our companion. And there's a constant conversation. And our craving, of course, is going to skew the way we view things. 
we have a strong desire for something, we then convince ourselves that the desire must be right. And you rearrange your views, or you rearrange your ideas of what's right and wrong to serve that desire. This is why, there, again, there's so much trouble in the world. People's views change very quickly in line with their cravings. This is one of the reasons why the Noble Truths, when the Buddha found them, he said, these really are noble. They don't change. They're unalterable. And your craving runs up against them, and it smashes. And of course, this doesn't prevent people from trying to change the Noble Truths. But then they're not going to get the advantage of believing in them and having faith in the Buddha's awakening. So the Buddha saw in the second knowledge. It's your views that make the difference. So the question is, is there a set of views that could inform the way out? And that's what the Four Noble Truths are. Instead of looking at beings and going through worlds, you can turn around and look at his mind and just saw events, views, intentions, basically instances of name and form. And we looked at things in those terms, he was able to step back from a lot of his preconceived notions and see simply, where is the stress? What's causing it? Is it possible to put it into it by attacking the cause? And the answer was yes. Okay, what are the qualities? What are the things you have to do in order to do that? Well, that's what the knowledge of the path came. Of course, he had already been practicing part of the path already. In terms of virtue, in terms of concentration, what was left, of course, was the discernment. That was the last piece. When that fell into place, then there was an opening, opening to the deathless. The question always had been, is there something that doesn't die? And here was the answer, this is it. So when you have faith in the Buddha's awakening, that's the ultimate thing you have faith in, that, that there is a deathless element that can be touched at the mind, and it can be found through your own efforts. And that's more than worth whatever difficulties you may have in, in following the path. So it's good to think those huge dimensions of space and time that the Buddha awakened to in the first and second knowledge. No matter how big they were, there was something that was outside of them, which he found in the third, which could be taken as a destination, something that would not change. The permanent is one of the epithets for nirvana. Nirvana itself is an epithet. It means unbinding, harbor, refuge, security, the unaging, the undying. That's what we have faith in. As long as you haven't touched that, it's good to remind yourself this is a possibility. And take it as your working hypothesis that this is going to be the worthwhile goal. Anything else you might take as a goal is worthwhile only in relationship to this. Anything you take as a goal that's going to get in the way of this, you have to remind yourself this is just going to lengthen the amount of time you're hanging around in suffering, in this process of samsara, wandering on. So we take the Buddha's awakening as the major event in world history, and as an event that has immediate percussions, immediate implications what we're doing right here, right now. Every right here, every right now.
It provides us with a challenge, but also provides us with hope. And whether that hope is going to be a live hope or an empty hope really depends on our own actions and the amount of faith we have in this possibility. It's going to be a huge contribution to the strength that allows us to muster whatever courage, whatever endurance, whatever persistence, mindfulness, concentration, and discernment we're going to need. It all gets based on this. Now, this is faith. We call it conviction to avoid the fact that faith is the F word in modern Buddhist circles. And it's good to remember it's not the kind of faith that rewards believing in things because they're irrational, which you find in some versions of Christianity. The kind of thing that we've been running away from. It's basically believing in something that is rational, but you can't prove it until you've actually acted on it. That's when we know. Like Sariputta at that time, at that point, he didn't need faith anymore, he didn't need conviction anymore. He'd found the deathless, he knew. So if you want to know if he was right or not, you know what you've got to do. But it's good to contemplate the Buddha's awakening every day and the implications it has in terms of the picture of space, the picture of time, the picture of possibilities in space and time, and then going beyond space and time. That helps to keep the events of each day in perspective. In which case, the difficulties of the pandemic don't seem so difficult after all. Because you realize the real difficulties are dealing with the parts of the mind that are recalcitrant, that resist. But they're no bigger than we are. Our only problem is we tend to identify with them. But when you look to see things in terms of the Four Noble Truths, where we don't think in terms of beings going into worlds, but simply events in the mind, it makes it a lot easier to cut away your attachment to things that you've held onto for so long. And that's where you find that strength of your conviction will really help.